Hello everyone. So today we're going to talk a little bit more about message testing. And this is a subject that I know we've addressed over and over again over the course of the semester. Um, but this is really the first chance we've had to really go in depth as to what it is, why it's important, why we don't necessarily do message testing, and why we should. So let's dive right in. So let's start with the basics. What is message testing? Well, it's exactly as it sounds. It is a form of communications testing by which a baseline control message is evaluated or compared to alternative test messages with the objective of increasing your desired response. And every testing scenario is gonna have a different desired response, depending on whatever your campaign is, whatever your, your goals are. And the way that I like to think about it, message testing is an experiment. And I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth with that in just a moment. So first of all, why don't we test? And I think those of us who have had any experience, um, especially for me in the nonprofit world, where everything is on a very limited budget, um, huge time crunch, I found myself often not doing any message testing. So why is that? Well, first of all, when we come up with a campaign, we think we know what the message should be. That's part of our brainstorming. That's part of the ideas process. And quite often, we do have some sort of prior research, prior experience, inside knowledge. There's something that leads us to believe that this is the best message for that scenario. But that's not always the case. Along the same line, we know or we think we know what the target audience is. We have in our brain who we want to who we want to target, who is our key public. But yet again, without doing any actual testing, we can't be sure that this is the best target audience for our message or for our campaign goals. And like I mentioned before, testing it it can be quite expensive. There are more inexpensive ways to do it. And there are very, very expensive ways to do it. It kind of runs the gamut, but quite often for a campaign, it costs a great deal of money. And it also, it takes time. We come up with some sort of campaign message. We, you know, get all of our things together. We're, we're ready to implement. We don't want to have to take two steps back to test our message. We're excited. We're ready to go. And there's kind of this um, this common phrase in um, in any client based uh, business interactions that you can have a product that is good, you can have a product that is cheap, and you can have a product that is fast, but you can only pick two. So quite often, the cheap and the fast, you can't have both and still have a really good quality product. So there's always going to be some sort of compromise there. So I kind of, you know, these are all the reasons why, why we don't test, but why should we test? Well, even if we do come up with a decently good message or, you know, a, a pretty good target audience, testing is always going to improve our efficiency. It's always going to give us the absolute best form of that message or absolute best, most specific target audience that is possible. And by testing our message prior to implementing it, we also have the advantage of finding out what the challenges and the opportunities are going to be that come along with that message. Um, for instance, you know, we might have a really terrific message for a particular target audience. And let's say that 70% of that audience has an extreme, an extremely positive reaction to our message. But then 30% of the audience 
has an extreme negative response. So although we had a good message, it was worked really well for the majority of our target audience, through message testing, we might determine that it's really just not worth having that such a negative response with that 30%. So testing is going to reveal some of those particulars. Um, it's also going to increase our likelihood of intended success. So it's going to make sure that not only is it the best form of the message, the most efficient form of the message, but that it actually works to fulfill our campaign objectives or campaign goals. And on the other side, it reduces the likelihood of unintended reactions, like I mentioned with that 30% who really reacted very, very negatively. And as a communications professional, especially with the economy as it was and as it continues to be and budgets being diminished, it is always, always important that we prove our performance. Um, and so much time and energy and resources go into developing these media messages and campaigns that clients want to be reassured in the most concrete manner possible that those dollars are not only being effective, but efficient as well. And clients love numbers and message testing is one way that you can give them solid concrete numbers as to like I said, the effectiveness and the efficiency of what you are doing. So who should test messages? I mentioned communications professionals. That's going to be everybody from advertisers, public relations practitioners, um, web designers, graphics designers. But that's also going to be your politicians, your community leaders. Anyone who is putting out some sort of messaging to meet a goal is going to benefit from testing their message prior to dissemination. This is, is a good quote. It simply says, sophisticated marketers are learning and growing all the time and testing more subtle variables while seeing dramatic gains in results. And this is from Carolyn Goodman, who's the president of Goodman Marketing Partners in California. So when you're developing a campaign, where does that testing fit in? At what point do you undergo your message testing? Well, and this is like, a, you know, a, a very simplified version of the campaign steps, but basically first thing you want to do always is to define your campaign goals. And then you're going to do some research and you're going to kind of figure out and identify who the target audience is for those campaign goals. Based on that target audience, you then want to generate your messages. So this is where that baseline control message comes from. You've already generated your, your one message or your series of messages that you best think will fit that campaign goal and fit with that target audience. And then you want to test, 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 test. You wanna test the messages individually. You wanna test them with the target audiences. The more tests you do, the better your results are going to be. The more information you're gonna get out of it. And then once you've done all this testing, you want to revise. You want to take all the knowledge that you've learned and you want to create the very best messages possible. And then you want to test those as well. So it's kind of this, this cycle until you get really, really positive results. The more testing you're going to do, the better. Once you have those messages that are, are proven, that you think are going to be the most efficient out there, then you want to implement. And then, of course, you always want to evaluate. So how do we test messages? Like I mentioned, first, you're going to have your, your original message. And you're going to designate this message as your control. So like I said, we're kind of looking at this like an experiment. Your original message is your hypothesis. You did the research. It's an educated guess as to the very best message for your goals and your target audience. 
then you want to develop your message variations or alternatives to the control. And quite often this is going to be through a brainstorming session, bringing other people in, getting new, fresh, you know, ideas and outlooks. Um, but you want some really good, strong alternatives. And these are also going to be based on the research, your prior knowledge. They're, they're also going to be really strong, educated guesses. You know, and when I say messages, I think, at least in my mind, the first thing I think of is advertising copy. But it doesn't have to be advertising. It could be website coffee, copy. It could be graphics. It could be layouts, taglines, mission statements, entire websites. It's really any message that you are going to disseminate um, that you want to make sure is the best mes message possible. That's what you want to test. And so it can be something very, very specific, like a particular color choice or it can be something much more broad, like an entire website layout, depending on what you've kind of already established works for you and how much information you want to get out of it. So then you're gonna test to measure the effectiveness of both the control message and the variations. And there's quite a few different ways to do this. So the types of testing. Like most um, research that we've talked about, it's broken into the two main categories. We have qualitative testing and we have quantitative testing. Now there's pros and cons to both. Um, and when we're looking at qualitative testing, we're really looking at um, a lot more ideas, more people focused. You can get broader, newer information out of qualitative testing than you can quantitative. But on the flip side, quantitative testing is really going to give you those hard numbers. It's going to allow you to take whatever your results are and place it over a larger audience. So it really, did, it's kind of um, depending on, on what you need to get out of it. And when we're looking at qualitative testing, some examples are focus groups, in-depth interviews, um, projective techniques, which we haven't really talked a lot about, but we're all kind of familiar with things like word associations, sentence completions, that sort of thing. Now, quantitative testing, um, some examples of that, memory tests, um, which are, you know, like day after recall tests, where we want to make sure that not only was the correct message um, passed along, but that people actually retained that message, which is something really important in, in a lot of things, but especially in advertising. Persuasion tests, um, direct response tests, which we've talked about previously, and I'm gonna talk about a little bit more, but these are your, your A-B split tests, your multivariate tests. Then we have continuous measurement tests, this is the one where they have the actual dial that they're holding onto, and they can turn it to either positive or negative or anywhere in between as they're viewing an advertisement or um, any kind of, I think this is quite often done with, with visual um, film type um, messages. And then of course we have like physiological measurements. This is going to be your eye movement, your brainwave analysis, that sort of thing. And I have the link here at the bottom if anybody wants to go and look up some, some more in-depth information on any of these types of testing. But the one that I think is really going to be um, the most effective and probably the most used for us is going to be the AV testing. This one in particular is really fantastic for website design. And we've talked about it a little bit in the past, but I'm just going to go over it, um, do a quick review. So in this example, um, we have two designs of a website. We have version A and we have version B. Now version A is the existing design. This is our control. Version B is the new design. And you'll notice that version A and version B have a lot of similarities, but B is just an alternative. 
So you're really going to be able to pinpoint exactly what it is that's making one more effective than the other. You want to limit the number of variables as much as possible um, to really determine what variable it is that's making the difference. So once you have your two versions, then you want to split your website traffic between the two versions. And there's a, a lot of different ways um, to do this. And I'm going to go over the Google Analytics program in just a moment. Um, that makes it really, really simple to do this. And then once you have your, your website traffic split, you're going to run your test for um, a set amount of time, and then you're going to measure their performance based on whatever your, your metric or goals were. Now, for this particular website, it had a sign-up form. And what they really wanted to see was in which location where they placed the sign-up form, which is the most effective for gaining the most amount of the, the largest number of sign-ups. So you'll see that version A had 50 sign-ups. This was our existing design, where version B had 75 sign-ups. And since almost all the other content was kept the same, we can take from this experiment that moving the sign-up form to the version B location resulted in a greater number of sign-ups. So that's probably going to be a change that we're going to want to keep. So what are the do's and don'ts of A-B testing? Well, one of the major don'ts is you don't want to wait to test your variation until after you've tested the control. And what I mean by that is you always want to take the same traffic, the same audience group, and split it. And the reason for this is simply to limit the number of variables. You don't want the, the time, any cultural events, any announcements, anything like that to change the type of traffic that you're running between your control and your variation. So the easiest way to do that is just take the same pool of people and split your traffic. Another don't is you don't want to end the testing too early. Um, Google Analytics, which is a um, program that we've talked about and that does one of these um, testing scenarios, they recommend at least a two-week run in order to achieve a 95% confidence interval. And 95% is normally the goal when we're wanting to um, determine whether something is statistically significant. So if we're wanting to be able to say that the location of the sign-up was statistically significant and caused that increase in the number of sign-ups, then we want to run the test for two weeks, at least two weeks. Now, another thing that we don't want to do, we don't want to surprise our regular visitors. If we have a website that has really strong traffic and um, you know, some really loyal visitors, we don't want to move things around so much that we're going to turn them off for some reason and they're not going to come back. So one of the ways that you can do this is when you split your traffic, you can decide only to conduct your test on new visitors or only conduct your test on infrequent visitors. Um, there's a lot of different metrics that you can use. Now, if you have a website that does not have a lot of traffic, or it's already a new website, or you just don't have that kind of loyal fan base built in, then it's probably fine to conduct your experiment over all of your, your traffic. Because the more amount of people, the, the more, um, the better your data is going to be. Um, and we don't want to let our gut feeling overrule our results. Going back to the beginning, why we don't message test, we we kind of, um, as communicators, we think we know the best answer. And that's part of our job, is to think we know the best answer. But quite often, through message testing, we're surprised by the results. And so if you run a really good experiment, you're careful about 
um, limiting your variables, getting a good sample, splitting your traffic, all those sort of things, and you get a really strong result opposite of what your gut is, go with that result. That's the reason for message testing. Now, what are some of the do's? Um, do know when to give up if a variation is not at all performing. If, for instance, going back to the, the sign up website, if after a week, version two has zero signups and version A is, you know, at 35, 40, something like that, it's probably safe to assume that version B is not going to be the best alternative and that it would be a better use of our time to end that experiment early, figure out what is what is wrong with version B and make some changes in order to start the experiment back up again. Um, we also, when we're doing this testing, if at all possible, we want to make our tests consistent across the whole website. Now, this is mostly important for websites that maintain some sort of structure on every page. For instance, if we're trying to figure out the best place to put a donation button and we have it on one place on the landing page and it jumps to a, another location on the rest of the website, it's not only going to confuse people, but it's going to confuse your results. So when at all possible, keep your tests consistent. Um, and finally, run lots of tests. However many that you can justify the cost and the time for, you're going to get, if, if done well, you're going to get some really good, strong information out of it. So I mentioned um, Google Analytics, and they have a program called Content Experiments. And this is a multivariate testing platform. So just like the A-B split testing, same idea, but you can have up to five variations of a page as opposed to only being able to test um, two at a time. And it was launched in um, 2012, and they're, but they're regularly adding new features. So it's continually being updated. And prior to 2012, they did have another program. I believe it was called Web Optimization and it's essentially the same program, but Content Experiments has a lot more functionality. So if you're familiar with what was web optimization, it's basically the same thing. This has taken its place. And it um, lets you test which version of a landing page or, or which version of, um, of your, your homepage of a website leads to the greatest improvement in whatever your, your goal is um, or whatever you deem your metric to be. Okay, so unfortunately this screen share program is not gonna allow me to switch to a different screen to show you the Google Analytics program. Um, but I encourage everyone to take a few minutes at some point just to familiarize yourself with kind of what the capabilities are and I can tell you that if you're looking at your Google Analytics page um, and you go down to on the left hand side, there are the standard reports. One of the categories is called behavior. And at the bottom of that section, there's um, a thing called experiments. And that's what you're looking for. And it's going to allow you to create your experiment. It, you can give it a name. Um, to my knowledge, it's fairly unlimited as to how many experiments that you can have going. So even though you could only have five variations of a page running, you could have multiple experiments to test more than those five variations um, if you so chose. And it's really, it's super easy to do. It's very user friendly. It just asks for the URLs for the two or however many pages you want to compare. Um, it gives you a lot of different goal or, or metric um, suggestions and capabilities. It also, one of the things that I really liked is it does tie into their ad program, their AdSense program. 
So if one of your metrics has to do with advertising and you already have some goals set up through that program, it allows you to use those goals for this content experiment page. Um, it also allows you, if you have a particular goal that's not listed, it allows you to kind of go in and do some, some custom things. Um, and I haven't played with that a whole lot because every, every metric that I could think of that I would use is already listed. But I'm sure somebody who um, does this for a living or does some a little more sophisticated testing, there's a lot of really cool things that they could come up with to test. And it's anybody has used Google Analytics, it's done the exact same way where they give you code that you just place um, on your, your HTML and it tracks everything for you. And it will let you determine, um, you know, what percentage of your audience that you want to test, how you want to split the testing. It gives you a, a lot of, of control over that sort of things. So I, I encourage everyone to um, to take a few minutes at some point and check out that program. And that is also a free program, which is a huge benefit. And this is what the results kind of look like. Um, these are not my results. This is just something that I found that they ran um, for six days. It looks like they had five different versions, five variations plus the original. And they got about 7,000 visits. And it really tells you on each day um, how many visits each page got, what the, how many conversions there were, and obviously whatever you determine as your conversion is what they're going to measure, and then how that conversion rate compares to the original page. So that's what I really liked, that it really breaks it down super simply for you. Um, and compares, you know, whether things went up, whether things went down, what percentage, and really determines for you um, what the winner is. So that's a very cool program. So what happens when messaging goes wrong? What happens if perhaps um, businesses don't message test or they don't message test quite enough? Um, these are two really great examples. They're both on the humorous side, um, but they both had very, very strong negative reactions from consumers. And I'm going to give you just a, a quick overview of them and then let you um, just pause this presentation and let you watch them. They're both super quick. They're both under a minute because they're just commercials. Um, and the first one isn't even the full commercial. This is a commercial for Pop Chips. Um, and it was, it featured Ashton Kutcher and he played four different characters. And the whole premise of it is that there's a fake dating show. And they did ads for both billboards and um, television commercials. Um, and the particular character that I'm going to show you here that consumers did not appreciate was the character Raj. And this features Ashton in full brown face. Um, and like I said, it did not go over well with consumers. So take a look at that. And then the second message gone wrong. This is a 2009 Super Bowl commercial for Teleflora. Now, as a Super Bowl commercial, obviously it's meant to simulate, um, you know, people talking about it. And sometimes companies go a little edgier than they might otherwise go. Um, but this is a commercial that was still deemed both insulting and just um, it, it didn't really work. It didn't really make people feel good and feel like they wanted flowers um, brought to them. So take a look at that. Um, and like I said, just pause this and then come back whenever you're done. Okay, so obviously, Advertising is a great example of um, messages that should have been tested, but political slogans and things that politicians say are also a really um, are, are really messages that would benefit strongly from some good message testing. And these are some examples of some political slogans that either did not work or people didn't identify with or they just really didn't appreciate. 
Um, so the first one is .gov. This is a gubernatorial campaign in Illinois playing off of the Got Milk commercials um, using kind of this hip abbreviation for governor, but it didn't work. <laughs> the, the people in Illinois did not did not care for it. They thought that it was a little um, a little too casual um, and not something not respectful enough for a gubernatorial campaign. Um, the next one is Barry Goldwater's presidential campaign. This is against um, President Lyndon Johnson. And as you can tell right away, because it was against President Lyndon Johnson, um, it did not work. He did not win. He was never a president. And the, the slogan is, in your heart, you know he's right. Um, and, you know, it was, it was meant to be a heartfelt sentiment, um, but people just really didn't identify with it. And they kind of made fun of it. The next one is not an official slogan, but it was a de facto slogan um, from President Bill Clinton's 1992 presidential campaign. This is just something that his campaign manager came up with that they wanted to keep in mind. And it's it's the economy, stupid. Um, and like I said, they didn't actually use it, but people that heard about it, they did have it posted in their like campaign offices and stuff. Um, and people thought that the use of the word stupid was probably not appropriate um, for a presidential campaign. The next one is Christine O'Donnell, who ran for US Senate seat in 2010. This was how she started all of her political commercials with the slogan, I'm not a witch, I'm you. Um, and People felt like it was she was trying to address um, her her background and accusations of her um, being a Wiccan, um, but it just it didn't it didn't go over well. It didn't work. And then the last one is one of President Harry Truman's slogans from the 1948 presidential campaign, and it's "Pour it on him, Harry." Um, and people felt like this had connotations that weren't appropriate for a presidential campaign. And he actually, he won this campaign, but it wasn't due to the slogan. He had a number of other slogans that were um, much more effective um, and and had a, another, you know, a lot of other things going for him for this campaign. So, so um, in recent years, kind of Obama for America in particular in 2012, um, they really embraced the idea that message testing was going to be very, very important. Um, in Obama for America, they sent out the, um, they sent out national fundraising emails on behalf of the Obama campaign. And they sent them out almost every day, increasing to multiple times a day as election day drew near. Um, and this is a quote from Toby Fallsgraf, who was the director of email for Obama for America, and he said in um, response to asking about message testing, he said, sometimes we'd see a lift of anywhere between 5% or 10%, but 5% or 10% on an email that's projected to raise a million dollars is a lot of money. It's totally worth our while. So that's why we had 20 writers and 20 email staffers working at all hours of the night to make sure these tests were ready. And I have a link here with the actual um, case study. If anybody is interested in kind of reading through everything, it's really, really fascinating. Um, but I am gonna kind of go through just their, their daily testing process. So as he mentioned, um, they had about 20 writers and 20 email staffers that they worked every single day. And the first thing that they would do is just write a bunch of emails. Um, and because they were sending out emails every single day, they needed fresh new content on a regular basis. So once they had a, a good um, group of emails, they chose four to six of the very best of them, and they had brainstorming sessions. And what they were brainstorming were subject lines to go with each email. 
So, you know, if they had four to six emails, they would have to come up with between 12 to 18 subject lines in total. So then once they had that established, then they really wanted to tailor their copy. So they wanted to figure out what of the chosen emails that they had taken a look at, which ones would go with which segments of the audience. So they were really trying to match emails, um, subject lines, and audience members all together. And then kind of once they had that figured out, then they wanted to test. And they tested both the emails and the subject lines to the various audiences so that they could come up with the best subject line and the best message that went with it. So they kind of, they tested both individually, but keeping in mind that there were three or four subject lines for every email. So they made sure that they went together. And then once the best of the messages and the best of the subject lines that go with that message were established, they'd send it out to, you know, the entire nation, everybody that had signed up for these emails. And then the very next day, they would start all over again. Um, which I thought was was very cool that they were really focused on getting really fresh, new, um, exciting content every day. And the results, they kind of speak for themselves. The team's best performing subject line, which was, I will be outspent, and their best performing email, um, which I have linked here if you want to read through it, it raised more than $2.6 million. And this was just one email on one day during the entire campaign process. Um, so I thought that was, that was pretty fantastic results. So let's kind of, we'll, we'll go back into, into the advertising a little bit more. What were they thinking? These are print ads. Um, and I have a number of examples of advertisements that probably should have done a little more more message testing. Um, in many scenarios, they were promptly pulled once consumers reacted to them. Um, this first ad is, is one of those. This is from Reebok, and this was not um, printed here in the United States. This was actually in Germany, and it says, cheat on your girlfriend, not on your workouts. People did not appreciate the sentiment. There was consumer backlash. It was pulled. The next one is for Belvedere. This is a vodka company. And it says, unlike some people, Belvedere always goes down smoothly. Um, and obviously this is in reference to uh, smooth tasting vodka, easy to drink, um, but people felt like the message paired with the imagery, it was referenced too much like sexual assault um, and wasn't something that was appropriate for an advertisement. The next one is Piperline.com, which is a clothing company online. And it says, every time you wear sweatpants in public, a single guy leaves New York. Let's get dressed. Um, and, and this was one that it wasn't, not everybody disliked. I think a lot of people could potentially agree with the sentiment. Um, but a lot of people found it to be insulting. And this was, it's on a coffee sleeve. Um, so it was something that kind of surprised people in the morning. I'm not sure which um, coffee uh, company that they used this on, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't one of their more popular advertising campaigns. Um, the next one is another one that was very controversial in that some people really applauded this advertising campaign and really felt like it was effective in generating discussion. And this is for the Lung Cancer Alliance, and they have a campaign, and I believe it's still going on, called No One Deserves to Die. But what was interesting is the way that they um, promoted the campaign, and, and many of, of you have probably seen this or learned about it or read case studies about it, but they started posting um, putting up posters and billboards and things like that, that had some sort of message like hipsters deserve to die or um, cat ladies deserve to die or something like that paired with an image of a person. 
And it wasn't until later that it was revealed that it was for this bigger campaign. And the idea is that no one deserves to die. Um, but until that reveal, there was um, a little bit of a negative backlash as to what the heck these these posters were in reference to. But like I said, that's controversial as to whether that was actually a what were they thinking, because it was a very strategic move. They knew that was going to be the response. The next one is for controltonight.com. It says she didn't want to do it, but she couldn't say no. Um, and this is a campaign encouraging women to um, drink responsibly and not put themselves in potentially dangerous situations. Um, and unfortunately, not only did this campaign place the blame on, on victims, um, but more importantly, the, um, the graphics that they cho chose to place on these, I believe this was a poster, this one in particular, um, previous victims felt like this poster was really in bad taste and that it kind of, it brought back very, very strong negative memories for them. Um, and they, they didn't think that it was, um, it was appropriate. And then the final one, this is for Nivea, um, this specifically Nivea for men, which is a skincare company. And I apologize that it's a little blurry, but it says, look like you give a damn, re-civilize yourself. And it features an attractive African-American man who is very cleanly shaven, buzz cut, and in his ha hand is um, another man who has a, a full Afro facial hair. And it's kind of, it's giving off this message that by sporting an Afro facial hair, something like that, that you don't give a damn or you don't look like you give a damn and that potentially you're not the most civilized version of yourself. So what does this have to do with different cultures? This was something that our readings did a really great job um, taking a look at um, how messages need to be tailored for, for different cultures. So what is culture? Um, this is uh, an image of Hofstede here, um, and he's the one who came up with the different dimensions of culture, and he defines it as the collective programming of the mind, excuse me, distinguishing the members of one group or category of people from another. And this category does not have to refer just to nations. It can also refer to regions, ethnicities, religions, occupations, organizations, genders, any group that has some sort of collective programming. Um, and these are, I'm going to just kind of go through this really quickly because we all read about it, but these are his dimensions of culture. Most of us have learned uh, about five dimensions of culture. In 2010, he decided to add a sixth one, which is the one, the very last one on the list, indulgence versus restraint. Um, and these are just, they, they describe the effects of culture on the values of its members. Um, and they really, um, and, and how these values relate specifically to behavior. And the image right here, this is a, a quick um, graphic. It has China, the Philippines, and the United States, looking at the different scores um, for the various dimensions. So, one of the organizations that we kind of know as that, you know, does a really good job of tailoring their messaging, their, their menu, their restaurants, all the different aspects of their company culture to the various um, cultures where they, where they're located is McDonald's. So I pulled three different television ads. Um, they're all McDonald's ads that I kind of felt were had three very different um went in three very different directions all for the same restaurant mcdonald's the first one is from japan the second one is from russia and the last one is from france 
Um, so I encourage everyone, they're all commercial, so they're very quick. I encourage you to pause this recording, take a look at them. And what I really want you to think about is specifically whether you feel like any of these ads would work in the United States and what would have to be changed in order for them to work with our culture. So, and then the, the final thing, this is just a really quick example. Um, you know, we're looking at advertising, but for us specifically, websites and website design is gonna be uh, something really key that we're all looking at. And this is an example of two different websites that sell almost identical products. The first one is from the United Kingdom. The second one is from France. And it kind of shows you, based on the different cultures, um, some of the choices that the web designers made in order to, to best suit that culture. For instance, in the link on the bottom, it kind of goes into depth as to some of those choices. But examples might be um, in France, retail tends to feature really prominent pricing. So you can see on the one on the right, it has these the big prices in bright red or kind of pink lettering. Um, British design, especially British web design, tends to feature very minimalistic layouts and designs, um, but they also tend to really appreciate um, very good quality photographs. So you will notice on the UK version um, that the images of the products are very, very well done. But if you have time, um, this is a definitely an interesting read to kind of go through. And it also looks at different color choices um, and, and different things that you have to keep in mind when designing websites for, for various cultures. So what about you? Have you ever encountered a communications? You know, what were they thinking? Have you have you seen one recently? Um, I'd love to, to hear what your thoughts were about it. Um, I'd also love to know, have you or your company ever conducted some sort of message testing before you, you publicly disseminated a message? What, what type of testing did you do? Um, you know, and, and did you think that it was worth it? What, what was your opinion on, on how it went? Have, have you ever been surprised by what tested positively? Whether you conducted the test or you're reading about a case study, um, do you think after what we've talked about in this class, do you think you are more likely to message test in the future? And are there times when you would suggest not message testing? Um, when do you think it's, it's realistic? And when is it just, you know, a waste of resources? Um, so I really encourage if anybody has